Hey you lot, Parthia, and in this video I want to take a look at three weirdly shaped balls used in three different sports, as well as some of the interesting physics behind each one of them. So if you enjoy this video then please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. The first weirdly shaped ball I'd like to take a look at is the cricket ball. It would be a perfectly ordinary spherical ball were it not for this bit, known as the seam. The seam actually holds together the two hemispheres, the two half spheres of leather, but it's actually exaggerated with some extra stitching because this bit is responsible for much of the interesting and strange behavior that we see from a cricket ball. For those of you unfamiliar with cricket, the main aspect of the game consists of a bowler bowling the ball from one end of the cricket pitch to the other, where an opposing player with a bat tries to smack the ball in different directions in order to score runs. There's more to it than that, of course, but these are just the very basics. In this video, I'd like to look at the physics of two different ways in which the bowler can bowl the ball. Let's start with spin bowling. Spin bowling consists of the bowler not only lobbing the ball from one end to the other, but also imparting some rotation onto the ball. This rotation is imparted in the direction of the seam, and in its simplest form, a spin ball will go straight onwards through the air when it's bowled, but as soon as it lands on the ground, it will deviate. What's really happening here is that when the ball interacts with the pitch when it lands, it will exert a force on the pitch due to the rotations that the bowler imparted on the ball. Specifically, if the bowler spins the ball in this direction, then the ball will exert a force on the pitch in this direction. And when one object exerts a force on another object, Newton's third law of motion tells us that the second object will exert an equal and opposite force on the first object. Therefore, if the ball exerts a force on the pitch in this direction, then the pitch exerts a force on the ball in this direction. This is what causes the ball to change direction upon interacting with the pitch when it lands. So that is a very, very basic description of spin bowling. I'd like to take a look at another kind of bowling, swing bowling. Swing bowling is different to spin bowling because in spin bowling, the ball changes direction when it pitches on the ground. But in swing bowling, the ball moves laterally or sideways through the air. Let's imagine that a bowler is bowling the ball with the seam pointing in this direction. That is the direction in which the ball will swing. Let's see why that happens. As the ball travels through the air from one end of the pitch to the other, it interacts with air molecules that are in its way. And these molecules actually end up exerting an uneven force on the ball, specifically due to the direction in which the seam is pointing. With a brand new ball, one that's not been used very much yet, both sides of the ball are pretty smooth and shiny, but the seam is rough because it's made up of stitching. It's got pieces of thread coming in and out of the leather. And so if we imagine us moving with the ball and the air molecules rushing past us, then the air molecules moving past this half of the ball will move very smoothly along the smooth surface of the ball. This is known as laminar flow because a lamina is a smooth sheet and the air molecules basically move in smooth sheets along the smooth surface of the ball. Now this smooth sheet-like flow tends to separate from the ball relatively quickly. Whereas if we look at the other half of the ball, the air molecules flowing in this direction are going to have to deal with the rough seam. The seam does not allow for nice smooth laminar flow. Instead, what we experience is turbulent flow. This is basically chaotic motion. The air molecules move in lots of different directions over the ball. And it turns out that this kind of turbulent flow is actually much better at sticking to the surface of the ball. Therefore, it leaves the surface of the ball much later. The net result of this is that the ball, as it moves through the air, causes air molecules to be shoved off in this direction. And once again, using Newton's third law of motion, if the ball is exerting a force in this direction on the air molecules, then the air molecules will exert a force in this direction on the ball, equal and opposite forces. This is the reason why a brand new cricket ball swings through the air, assuming the seam can be consistently kept pointing in the same direction. Now, there are of course many types of bowling other than spin or swing, so do yourself a favor and go watch some cricket. For this video though, I'd like to move on to another sport. Now, if cricket was the sport that I grew up watching and I still continue to watch to this day, then badminton is the sport that I play on a regular basis. At the highest level, badminton is a ridiculously fast paced, intense and athletic sport. It's actually the fastest racket sport in the world, with the unofficial smash record being 426 kilometers per hour in a match situation, and 493 kilometers per hour outside of a match situation. But what I want to talk to you about is the projectile used in badminton. It's known as a shuttlecock, sometimes just shuttle or a birdie or a ball, but we can see that it's not a ball. 
The bottom part of it is indeed a hemisphere. It's made out of cork. But then the top part is made up of 16 goose feathers, arranged in a very specific way. This specific arrangement of goose feathers has important consequences for right-handed players versus left-handed players, as we will see shortly. But first, let's take a look at a more general property of shuttles. Now, because a shuttle contains lots of feathers, the drag coefficient of a shuttle is extremely high. What this means is that even though shuttles can be hit at ridiculous speeds, they will lose a lot of their speed compared to any other projectile being hit at the same speed. Now that's not to say that the shuttle is slow by any means. It's still traveling faster than a couple of hundred kilometers per hour by the time it gets to the other side of the court in many cases. But the point is, is that it loses speed very, very quickly. And so if we were to lob, say, a tennis ball, the trajectory that it would take is something like this. It's sort of minimally influenced by air resistance. But due to the extremely high drag coefficient of the shuttle, its motion will look something like this. Oh, and by the way, as an aside, when you hit a shuttle, it always moves so that the cork end goes first, apart from in a few very specific situations. Now, I'd like to take a little bit more of a detailed look at the feathers in the shuttle. According to the regulations of badminton, the feathers are specifically arranged this way and not this way. This is important because one type of shot that is commonly played in badminton is known as a slice. This is when the racket strings essentially slice against the cork of the shuttle. And this can cause the path of the shuttle to bend laterally, as well as move more crisply down towards the ground at the expense of a bit of power. But because the feathers are loaded into the cork asymmetrically, if we were to take a right-handed player and a left-handed player, and they were to play the exact same shot but mirrored, so one using a right-handed slice and the other using a left-handed slice, we wouldn't see an exact mirror image in terms of the trajectory of the shuttle. The shuttle would respond slightly differently to a right-handed player slice compared to a left-handed player slice. This effect is not huge, but it's noticeable by players on court, and it's the only example that I can think of where something in a sport is designed specifically to react differently to right-handers compared to left-handers. If you can think of more examples, let me know in the comments down below. And that's enough about badminton. Let's move on to the third sport that I'd like to discuss in this video, rugby. Now, I have to confess, I'm not someone who can claim to know a lot about rugby. The only time I've really watched rugby is when I watch my friends playing it at university. But one thing that really intrigues me is how rugby players pass the ball from one person to another. First of all, the rugby ball has a weird shape. It's shaped kind of like an American football, except the American football is a bit pointier. And although these two balls look similar, in reality, they behave fairly differently because the pointiness of the American football allows it to be thrown much more stably from one place to another, whereas a rugby ball is much more prone to tumbling end over end. So how do rugby players consistently pass the ball from one person to another? Well, one way to make the motion of a rugby ball very consistent and accurate is to actually impart some rotation on the ball in this direction. As well as lobbing it from one point to another, if the ball is rotating, it's actually much more likely to get to point B. The reason for this is that the rotation actually makes the motion of the ball much more stable through the air. What we've done is given the ball some angular momentum by rotating it in addition to the linear momentum that we give it by chucking it from point A to point B. Now, some of you may have heard of the law of conservation of angular momentum, which tells us that without an external force acting on our system, technically an external torque acting on our system, the angular momentum of that system will remain the same over time. Which means that once we've let go of the ball and it's already moving in this direction, the only thing that can change its angular momentum is the air that interacts with it. And these air molecules generally cannot exert enough of a force or enough of a torque to change the angular momentum of the rugby ball enough to make it tumble end on end like it would if we hadn't given it any angular momentum in the first place. Whereas if we chose not to give it any angular momentum, if we just chose to throw it from point A to point B, then any interactions with air molecules plus any imperfections in our throwing technique would mean that we could give it angular momentum in any direction. Basically, the point is that if it already has some angular momentum, then in order for it to become unstable, we'd have to overcome that original angular momentum. Whereas if it didn't have any angular momentum, then it wouldn't take much to give it some angular momentum in any direction and it could just be the one that causes it to tumble. And so that is my very basic analysis of three weird looking balls used in three very interesting sports. I thought I'd try something different, blend my interest in sports and physics. So if you enjoyed this video, then please do hit the thumbs up and let me know in the comments down below. Subscribe for more fun physics content, including some more heavy physics like Lagrangian mechanics, quantum mechanics and relativity and so on. And please do also check out my Patreon page if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you very soon. Thank you.